Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome to our lecture series. Today we have uh, a really good friend um, and uh, a champion, really, for human rights. Um, and she's here in Los Angeles. She is, uh, her name is S.D. Chandler, um, who's a longtime film and media professional, now focusing her work on human rights. In 2010, she founded the Los Angeles chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace, JVP, a national organization promoting solutions based on human rights and international law for both Palestinians and Jewish Israelis that works in broad coalition with other like-minded organizations. She is now a member of the Jewish Voice for Peace Board of Directors and serves as the chair of the Board of Directors of JVP's sister organization, JVP Action. Along with Negra Ibrahim, whom uh, many of you probably know and has been uh, working, uh, who has worked at MPAC uh, many years ago um, and is from the Islamic Center. Um, they co-host uh, and produce a show for KPFK called Middle East in Focus. So I wanna thank Esty for joining us today. If you could turn on your video. I'm trying, but I think somebody needs to flick a switch on your side. Oh, okay. All right, Anne, if you can help uh, us do that. Oh, I think she got it. There okay, there you are. Hi, Esty. It's great to see you. Good to see you, nice flowers in the back. What does that say on, on the wall back there? It says gather. Gather. It's my dining room. That's nice. Well, today is Jum'ah, which is the day of gathering. So I set us up in the right room. <laughs> You, you do, you do. Well, go ahead, SD. We want to hear from you and then we'll engage in conversation. And I encourage everybody to uh, ask questions. Uh, we'd be happy to, um, to have conversation uh, after SD makes her presentation. Fantastic. So I thought I would start by telling a bit about my personal story. Um, I came to my work on Palestine and Israel in a bit of an unusual way. Uh, it began not long after I had spent a year organizing for the Obama for America campaign here in the San Fernando Valley back in 2008. So during that campaign, I realized that in spite of all the time that I had spent in Israel with my large family and my father's many friends, my father's Israeli, um, I really didn't know enough about what was going on in Israel, like the so-called you know, facts on the ground, um, why they always seem to be at war, uh, or even the history that might help me understand those things, which I also really felt I needed to know at that time in order to understand the many virulently racist emails that I was seeing coming from people in the Jewish community, um, sometimes from Jewish organizations, uh, from Jews in Israel, about my candidate. Um, you know, when I approached people on the campaign, they really didn't want to talk about it, which of course I understand now, but I really didn't at the time. Um, nonetheless, I you know did what we were asked to do: put our head win, let's put our heads down, let's win this campaign. Um, but I put a pin in it and promised myself that I would come back to it later because I thought it, I, I somehow knew it was very important. And so following Obama's victory, and of course, then the horrific assault on Gaza, cast lead, that immediately followed his victory, but before his inauguration in 2009, um, to say that, you know, when I began educating myself and learned the history and read, you know, the contemporary reporting and watched some documentaries covering the quote unquote conflict, um, learned about the facts on the ground, um, and also about the founding of Israel, which, you know, to my in my mind included the roles that my own family members would have played in it. And it was personally devastating. And that's literally an understatement. Um, you know, very, very difficult to learn sort of alone in a silo. Um, 
And before my tears stopped flowing, I also realized that I wasn't going to be able to close the last book I read and just go back to focusing on healthcare reform, which was my top issue in 2009. It was clear to me, um, both in my heart and my mind, that as a Jewish person, I absolutely couldn't be silent as the occupation, the ethnic cleansing, the human rights violations, and the erasure of historic Palestine continued. Um, you know, I had seen what happens when people stand silently by as others are vilified, ethnically cleansed, and driven off to their slaughter. I, um, my affiliation with JVP happened a little bit later. Um, during the campaign, I met a quote unquote progressive Jewish organization when I was lucky enough to go to the DNC in Denver in August of 2008, having been elected as one of the two elected Obama delegates to the convention from my congressional district. Back then, I had no idea the role that this cause would come to play in my life. Uh, I really had hoped that the pro-Israel, pro-peace group that I met in Denver had answers for the troubling news stories I continued to read um, throughout 2009 and into 2010 as I continued to educate myself on the issues. Excuse me. And then one day I remember getting an email from the progressive Jewish group, but it was justifying their support for the UC student, uh, UC Berkeley student body president's unilateral veto of the student Senate vote to divest from two American weapons manufacturers who were supplying heavy weaponry to the Israeli Defense Forces and they were denouncing boycott and divestment. To my mind, claiming to be pro-peace while taking the few nonviolent tools of citizen action available off the table smelled a little gefilte fishy to me. But there was this other organization that was consistently mentioned in the stories about the brouhaha that had befallen on Berkeley over the divestment vote. So with my summer ram uh, romance with the pro-peace Jewish group over, um, I decided to really fully investigate this second Jewish organization I was reading about who very interestingly to me was on the side of the students who had voted to divest. That organization, of course, was JVP. And after I read everything on their website, and literally within a couple of weeks of my joining and sending them a note about, you know, why I joined and how they really needed a chapter in Los Angeles, you know, take my tip. Um, they scheduled a meeting with me and you know, soon we were discussing the idea of me launching a chapter here. And uh, that happened that fall, uh, in the fall of 2010. So both JVP and JVP Action, for those who aren't aware of us, are multiracial, intergenerational, um, or both organizations are part of our, our movement that is multiracial and intergenerational. Um, we are Jews and allies. We work towards justice and equality for Palestinians and Israelis equally, full stop. We draw strength from over a half a million supporters and decades now of organizing for freedom and dignity in Israel, Palestine, and in the US. Uh, JVP is a signatory to the Palestinian call for BDS, and we seek the goals of that campaign, ending Israeli violence against civilians, um, ending the occupation of Palestinian lands, uh, removing the apartheid or separation wall. 
we stand for the safety and self-determination for Israelis and Palestinians, uh, equality under the law, and of course the right to return for Palestinian refugees like everybody else in the world um, who want to return you know, based on principles established in international law. Um, we also oppose all forms of racism, including anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, and anti-Jewish bigotry. And that includes Zionism. We work towards our goals through various campaigns, um, also through educational events, by supporting student activists and other allied organizations and multi-faith and anti-racist organizations uh, locally in our towns, in our cities. We have over 70 chapters, plus uh, another, I think, dozen uh, student chapters across the country. And, um, and we also do it by promoting and engaging in boycott and divestment campaigns. Of course, these days, as the chair of, JVP, of the JVP Action Board, my work increasingly focuses on our governmental advocacy and um, also our political campaign work because JVP Action is a 501c4 and we focus on achieving our goals of justice and equality for Palestinians and Israelis by transforming US policy. We organize American Jews and allies uh, also to win progressive legislation, to change the public conversation and to elect progressive candidates from city councils to the White House. We believe that justice is indivisible. We build uh, with movements and with candidates who also see how our futures are bound up with one another and that our safety grows from our solidarity. We fight the, with those who are fighting, uh, we fight alongside people, I should say, who are fighting for a better, fairer, more sustainable world where justice, equality, and dignity are accorded to all people without exception. And, you know, with our Palestinian allies, since we launched JVP Action in 2019, we have been mapping out a path for Palestinian rights to become a core part of the progressive agenda, which we believe it has now become. Uh, JVP has long called for an end to US military funding to Israel until it uh, affords Palestinians living under the Israeli government to have full and equal rights. Um, until their human rights are respected, until Israel ends its military occupation of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, um, also Gaza and the Golan Heights, and uh, ends its now near 15 year illegal military blockade of Gaza. And again, until Israel recognizes the right of return for Palestinian refu refugees as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. Um, I think if anybody wasn't sure before, say, last May, I think since then, the rapidly growing momentum of the Palestinian equality movement is now very apparent to everyone. The media conversations have completely shifted. Conversations about apartheid about violent attacks by Jewish Israelis on nonviolent protesters and by, from violence on uh, citizen protesters by the Israeli police and military. Um, conversations about the disproportionate force used in Gaza, um, completely new topics for the mainstream media to be discussing were front and center. Um, and I think so it's fair to say that Palestine is now firmly positioned on the progressive agenda. In fact, uh, I don't know if other people noticed, but this week I saw um, that DSA's Palestine, uh, DSA Palestine, I think they call it, a, a committee within DSA, is kicking off a BDS summer school series that starts on August 21st. Um, it's not just 
the mainstream me media. There was a survey of Jewish American voters taken after Israel's recent assault on Gaza. It came out a couple of weeks ago now, I believe. And it found that about a quarter, 25% of Jewish American voters view Israel as an apartheid state and don't believe it is anti-Semitic in any way to say so. In fact, 22% agreed that, quote, Israel is committing genocide against the Palestinians. And with those percentages among younger voters, the percentages were much higher. So, you know, as mainstream pro-Israel organizations continue to struggle to make the case that Israel is central to Jewish identity and that criticism of it often veers into anti-Semitism, the polling results suggest that many American Jews agree with organizations like JVP and JVP Action, including a growing number of Democratic members of Congress who prove that they are willing to apply their own values universally. As far as, you know, Capitol Hill and Washington DC are concerned, I think that J Street, Donald Trump, and Benjamin Netanyahu have done a fantastic job of driving a wedge in APAC, leaving it now clearly as a Republican leaning organization. I think that the movement has also driven a wedge in the Democratic Party, where more and more representatives are willing to publicly hold Israel accountable for human rights abuses, for targeting civilian infrastructure, for abusing Palestinian children and trying them in military court and incarcerating them. Um, just some examples of why we leave that from, you know, this past spring and summer. Um, in March, 12 members of Congress sent a letter to Secretary of State Tony Blinken demanding that the administration take immediate action on Palestinian human rights. I believe it was in May that congressional representatives introduced a historic joint resolution of disapproval to confront Biden's position and the approval of a five, uh, sorry, $735 million sale of advanced weapon systems and, and munitions, including many of the very same ones used in the devastating military assault on Gaza that month. Um, in May and June, nine new co-sponsors signed on to Betty McCollum's uh, HR 2590, the Palestinian Children and Families Act, which JVP Action is very proud to endorse. Um, and those signatures coincided with our lobby days, which dragged out into lobby weeks um, back in the spring and summer, um, early summer. Um, and now JVP Action is calling on senators to oppose S2119, the Combating BDS Act of 2021. It's a blatantly unconstitutional bill encouraging states to pass laws punishing individuals and businesses for exercising their First Amendment protected right to advocate for Palestinian human rights and justice. Sadly, I think 35 states now have already passed anti-BDS legislation. Um, you know, if we're gonna be honest, JVP is sometimes marginalized by mainstream Jewish organizations and, you know, right-wing extremists um, on this issue. But when you think about it, we're marginalized for the same reason that Palestinians are, because we hold positions that are tough to challenge on their merits. So marginalization and smear campaigns, both public and privately, are employed, you know, along with like distractions, look over there, aren't they worse? You know, all sorts of things to divert from the topic of Israel's treatment of Palestinians. 
And of course, the more wins we achieve, the harsher and more racist the attacks have become and will continue to become. But that's also very much in line with the history of establishment politics, where pr the most progressive ideas have always been marginalized. Think about the, the, the Black Panthers who were out there serving their community and Malcolm X, who was unapologetic about his positions. You know, anti-Zionists, including Jewish anti-Zionists, have been around as long as the Jewish Zionist political movement has been. But only as the movement, the anti-Zionist movement, the, pro, the Palestinian equality movement grew. And once social media was able to challenge Jewish establishment narratives that were, you know, typed up and repeated by the mainstream media with our truth, did they really start attacking, attacking us, threatening us, and smearing us? We remain proudly pro-BDS, proudly fighting for Palestinian equality, including the right to return, and proudly in solidarity with Palestinians who are actually the people being harmed and abused. So that's why now we're doubling down. What's that? saying like, then they fight you, that's where we are, but next we win. And we remain one of the fastest growing Jewish organizations in the country. So I'm happy to have a conversation about, you know, these topics and more about JVP. Esti, thank you. That is a fascinating story. I don't know if you've written your autobiography, but I would be uh, right there up front and uh, purchase one uh, and have you talk more about your personal journey. Um, I just want to ask you a few questions and I see some people have already raised their hands. So we encourage people to participate. Either you can raise your hand and ask a question or go ahead and write a question in the Q&A box uh, that is on the bottom of the screen, uh, lower right hand side. And uh, we'd be happy to uh, engage in conversation. So I just wanted to go back to, you know, you, you being a delegate of, of uh, Barack Obama in 2008. And then as soon as he's elected president, uh, I think it was Netanyahu, I, probably a Netanyahu, there hasn't been another prime minister for quite some time uh, until recently, um, uh, launched a, 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 an invasion of uh, an attack uh, against Gaza. And Obama comes out right away and saying Israel has the right to defend itself. How did you feel being somebody who, who was hopeful about, like so many of us, we were hopeful uh, that there was going to be a change and then look like he was veering back towards establishment politics? Well, remember that this first came sort of into my zeitgeist during that campaign. So I really didn't have enough understanding at the time. I mean, to be honest, I had been on the working, you know, volunteering on that campaign full time for over a year at that point. And I was tired. So I was, you know, unplugging a bit. I had, you know, was, uh, you know, setting up some Google search words. I was being, you know, so I was being pushed articles and, you know, films and things that I was looking at. So I, I wasn't at that point where I am now, um, but I can tell you that, you know, it wasn't all that long before he began to disappoint me. And the, right before he left office, like, in his, his last month or two, he did this presentation at a famous uh, synagogue, I believe in Washington DC and literally made me cry. He drove me to tears because he said something that I know he knows is not true, which was he said the words anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And that just could not be further from the truth. And it literally, made me cry. Well, and, and 
you know, many people think that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And so how do you explain that to people? How do you explain that, you know, you being a Jewish anti-Zionist is something that is a part of your identity, part of millions of people I, I gather, but it, it doesn't seem like that group is, is represented. It's not recognized. And do you feel that recognition has improved lately or do you feel that it's still a, an uphill battle? I do think it's improved. And um, I can tell you that, you know, JVP took on the mission of, of setting the record straight. We came out, I wanna say it was, it's actually over two years ago now, maybe close to three, because it happened just as I was joining the board of directors. Um, we came out as anti-Zionist. We did, you know, we had some um, papers that we released, um, some articles, some information, but we realized that this was a something that people really were misunderstanding. And that was because it was framed for so long that, you know, anti-Zion, you know, that, that really any critique of Israel was anti-Semitic. And as, as, as Palestinians and other advocates started to understand that, you know, it wasn't Jews who were perpetrating this, it was Zionists, it was the Zionist political movement that started in the, you know, very end of the 1900s, which, you know, 50 years, you know, later before, you know, before Israel's founding, like wasn't, there weren't a whole lot of Jews from all over the world rushing to move to Palestine as the movement was asking for, because a lot of people thought it wasn't a good idea. And very prominent and famous Jewish intellectuals and thinkers were anti-Zionist and writing about it. And, you know, people like Albert Einstein feared that exactly what has happened was gonna happen. It wasn't unimaginable. It wasn't hard to predict. It was actually quite predictable. There were, you know, Jewish rabbis. Um, there were all sorts of people. In fact, you know, most European Jews were anti-Zionist before, you know, I think until after 1967. I think, I think after 1967, things shifted a bit. I, I don't think before that in, Jew, in synagogues, you had American flags and Israeli flags on the Bema, things that were abhorrent to most JVP rabbis that I've discussed it with, including our mutual friend and the late um, Rabbi Leonard Bierman, who, you know, that, that's crazy to have American flags and an and Israeli flag in a sanctuary for worship. So, um, you know, it's our job to educate people about the Zionist political movement and that, you know, in the, in the beginning of the movement, there were different ideas that, you know, some of them were more inclusive than others. But the fact of the matter is, from the time of Israel's founding until now, the way Zionism has purported itself has been apartheid, except for like six months in 1966, Israel has been an apartheid state. They have had separate laws for Palestinians and for Jews. Uh, we have a few questions uh, we'll get to right now uh, from Michael Singh. Uh, Michael produced a wonderful uh, documentary, uh, The Ghost of Valentino. Valentino's uh, Ghost. Valentino's Ghost. And, uh, and it's, it's something that I think everyone who wants to understand the relationship between uh, Hollywood and Washington uh, on this issue, um, it's a, it's, you must watch it, you must watch it. It's narrated by our friend, Mike Farrell, um, and it's wonderfully done. And I just wish uh, we had a wider audience uh, for, for these kinds of productions, just like I wish we, we, we had wider audiences for our lecture series, but you know, we start, we, we, we are humbled and uh, glad to have you with us, uh, Esty. Uh, you are definitely a, a true leader and a champion for human rights. Uh, Michael asks, 
Uh, any plans to engage with image makers in Hollywood who favor showing negative images of Arabs, Muslims over positive ones? Can you address them? Do they respond? Well, um, I thank Michael for the question, and I agree with you about how important that film is in showing the relationship between Hollywood and pop culture and Washington, D.C. Um, but I feel like one of the organizations that's actually done a fantastic job of engaging with Hollywood is MPAC, of course. You guys have really took taken this on. I don't know. It seems like about four or five years ago that it and and done a fantastic job. We of course work with people um, in in the industry when we get the opportunity. Um, as a Hollywood professional myself, um, I can tell you that there are many of us here who um, who you know quietly work to try to make a difference. There was a, um, I think it was um, Moments Magazine a few years back had a big article called um, the fight in Hollywood over the Holy Land or the fight over the Holy Land in Hollywood, which was really, really a long expose. And, you know, proudly they included JVP. And um, I sat for several interviews for it and, um, they, you know, the writer who did the article had done several articles about Israel and seemed like he was, you know, probably like a liberal Zionist. Um, but he, he did also seem, you know, to be trying to, you know, give space for other opinions. And I think one thing that they did that I was shocked about because I think it really puts me in a very sympathetic light was next to a photograph of uh, Scarlett Johansson, or, which was her soda stream ad. They put the wanted poster of me hmm. that was made by Zionists and left on the front porch of my home less than four months after I launched JBPLA and named the very small children in my family at the time um, by name. Wow, that's that's incredible. Um, uh, I'm just shocked at, at that story, Esti. And again, I I, I applaud uh, your perseverance, your um, your stamina, your 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 courage, and bravery uh, over such cowardly acts. Uh, by, by these people. Um, in, in terms of Hollywood, I, I also have to say, you know, as much as we'd like to think, yeah, we've made a lot of progress, which we have at, at MPAC. The one issue that, you know, we still can't talk about is Palestine uh, when it comes to Hollywood. It, it's still, you know, and, 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 and it takes us to this point of liberal politics. You know, Hollywood likes to be viewed as liberal um, but then, you know, it doesn't take much to peel from the surface uh, 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 racism and microaggressions uh, that occur on a daily basis in, in Hollywood. And so when it comes to the Palestinian issue, that's still uh, an untouchable uh, and we, we, we can't talk about it. So uh, well, perhaps we found an area that we can collaborate on because perhaps working together we can try to chip away at that yeah and and we'll bring michael in and would love always would love to have michael's wonderful wonderful filmmaking skills wonderful um and then we get a question from hadab hadab tarifi she said hi sd great to have you speak how do you see the new israeli leadership who are now who are not any better than netanyahu and their responses to the changes among u.s jewish views of israel as an apartheid state? Well, I completely agree with you that they are no different. Um, they, you know, I don't even think it, I, we used to worry that if somebody else got elected that then people would think, oh, they'll be better. I, I don't really think that that's happening with, you know, this group. I think that people understand that this group isn't gonna change the, you know, that Israel's modus operandi, the plan had always been 
all the people, all, all the land, as few pe of the Palestinians as possible. Um, this government is no different. Uh, we have to push just as hard. And, you know, the place where JVP chooses to push is where we have standing, which is here, which is with our government, with our elected officials. You know, back when that wanted poster was left at my house, my congressman refused to meet with me. He refused to have his staff meet with me. And when I showed up at a town hall, they worked very, they wouldn't give the microphone to anybody anywhere near me for fear. And now I can honestly say I have fantastic relationships with many local congressional representatives, including Jewish ones. And so, you know, we have, we have made a difference. And um, I think that we all have to keep pushing. I, the tool, we have, we have to use the tools that are available to us. And to my estimation, that is boycotting Israel, you know, checking your labels, looking at the apps, the boycott apps, um, and engaging with our, our representatives, whether they're our city council representatives, our congressional representatives, our senators, engaging with our media. Because after all, we are the consumers of media. And when we see people on TV or writing an article that isn't truthful, we need to call it out. We need to write letters to the editor. We need to write to the show and say, hey, you know, they said that, you know, why did they say when a Palestinian was killed, why do they say they died? But if an Israeli is killed, they say they, they were killed by terrorists. Like there's like different way that they frame everything. We have to call them out on it because after all, we are their customers. And if we stay silent, it's gonna continue. Thank you for that. Um, you know, in terms of LA, Los Angeles city politics, do you see opportunities for change there? Uh, the LA city, as you know, I remember, you know, Vera Gosa to, going to Israel, even Garcetti went to Israel and that was the, the whole brouhaha about moving the embassy uh, to Jerusalem. And uh, he, he, backed up, he backed off a little bit from that. Um, where do you see LA city politics and, you know, the next mayor and if there's an opportunity to talk to them in terms of having a more balanced position on, on Palestine, Israel? Well, I very much hope that we will be, now that we have JVP action and we can engage in elections, I, I hope that we will be engaged in the mayoral race. I can tell you from my own personal experience, I met Garcetti um, on the Obama campaign. He was one of the first elected officials to endorse Obama. And I had a friend who worked in his office and did events with him and we had, you know, a, you know, he seemed like a very good guy. In fact, when he opened his campaign office here, I live in the San Fernando Valley. When he opened his San Fernando Valley office, he stood in the office and talking to me and said, Esty, I'm glad that there's a JVP here in LA now. I was shocked that he would say that in that room with campaign supporters around. And of course, once he got in office, he consistently disappointed me and us and how he blocked things. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, living in Never Neverland. I, I understand the forces that are against us, but, you know, look at the forces with us, truth, justice, equality, anti-racism. I mean, we are where the zeitgeist of America is right now. And, you know, because Zionism is principled upon creating a state of Jews, by Jews, for Jews, and we've seen the way they treat the non-Jews, that is a racist endeavor. And it's our job to educate people about it. And it's our job to create alternative Jewish spaces for, you know, the many JVPers who don't feel welcomed in their synagogues and haven't for years. We have a whole Havara network now and actual congregations popping up across the country that are explicitly non-Zionist. 
And so that's all also part of JBP's work to create, you know, community for our own people. Um, and I think that the more we're out there, the more other Jews and allies see us, learn about us, decide that they like the way we work, um, that they like the way, you know, we are respectable, but forceful, and we don't back down from our positions because we have no reason to. We're telling the truth. Um, I think that the movement is going to continue to grow, continue to grow here in LA, and it's up to us to create those opportunities in city politics, LA City Council, in other towns around our giant, you know, um, uh, metropolis that we call Los Angeles. Thank you. And uh, Lori Margaret writes that there's a film benefit for Palestine at the Gardena Cinema. August 26th through the 29th. Thank and, you, Lori. And uh, there's an Eventbrite uh, link to it. I, I, unfortunately, I can't share it on the screen, but uh, you know, uh, Anne Marie, if you could, uh, if you can link to that, connect to the link and, and share it on the screen at any point, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Anne, Anne Marie. Um, have you heard of Dilawar Syed? I have not. He is a, a Biden appointee, and a Muslim from the Bay Area, a tech guy. And uh, he got appointed to, I believe, the Small Business Administration. And it required Senate confirmation. And uh, the typical Republican senators that, that you, you were referring to uh, came out against his appointment saying that he would be, it would be bad uh, for Israel if he, if he be, if he were confirmed. Um, you know, that's happened. I'm, I'm sure you've seen it happen hundreds of times. Oh, this is the event. Uh, the Gardena Cinema is the only old fashioned single state, uh, single standalone independent movie theater. And I think if you go down Amory, you'll probably see the um, Saturday, August 28th, Omar. Uh, okay, well, it's probably a special event then. Yeah, uh, it's a film it, festival, one yeah. of my favorite things. Yeah, it's a film festival. And I see they have Paradise Now playing. Um, so thank you, Anne Marie. So I, now that you mentioned it, I do think I remember reading about this, yeah. the horrible treatment um, of that nominee. Yeah. So and, and it happens, I mean, it happens all the time. Remember, like, Chuck Hagel, you know, all of a sudden was this horrible person when he was up for a role because of, like, one thing he said about treating you know, Palestinians and Israelis equally, or, yeah. you know, they lose their minds. I mean, Look at right now, like uh, as my friend Richard Silverstein has coined it, um, the ice cream war of the Jews that's going on, where people who are anti-BDS are actually, the, the Israeli government is calling on local uh, state politicians to slap, to sue entities that are, you know, Boycotting and like, can you imagine any other foreign government asking government, U.S. government entities to launch lawsuits? Like, what is more creepy and blacklisty than that? And the same people who have been saying boycotts are evil, they're horrible, they're wrong, are engaging in a giant campaign to try to now boycott Ben and Jerry's, calling them anti-Semites, right? right. Two, two Jewish hippies, come on. <laughs> it, it, it's crazy the things that are going on. And I think it actually just makes our point that of course people have the right to boycott and they have a right to boycott Ben and Jerry's too, but they sure have changed their tune about boycott. So you know, in terms of, you know, let's put JVP in one side and then APAC on the other. Um, where do you see representation in the grassroots? And then 
obviously APAC has more access to the higher levels of government for whatever reason. Let's say that that's what the government wants. And so they'll give uh, APAC more, uh, more space and more room. Um, how do you see that changing as well? So let, let's start with the, with the grassroots and then move our way up to government uh, access and positioning. Right. Well, I think that we, you know, we have empirical evidence about the grassroots. If you look at our following on social media on any of the platforms, we dwarf APEC. So, you know, the grassroots are with us. I think that we have to remember, you know, that I, like I said, I think J Street's done a great job of 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 splitting APEC to where because you know Jeremy Benami is a is experienced Washington insider who, who realized that APAC didn't represent most American Jews. And so, you know, J Street cleaved them off. But we also have to remember that it's not just APAC. When people think of the Israel lobby, you know, they think of APAC, which is a piece of it. But we have to be realistic in that they're not the only piece of it. The weapons manufacturers, that $3.8 billion, and it's even more than that because that's that sets aside additional money that's given for the um, Iron Dome and other projects, that that money is actually given via gift certificates with American weapons manufacturers. So it's it's those, it's Raytheon, it's, it's, it's you know, El, it, not Elba, it's an Israeli one, but those companies are the ones who are making the money. So their lobbyists want war to continue. They want war in the Middle East to continue. You know, so, and the other really, really powerful lobby that people really are not talking about enough are Christian Zionists. Christian Zionism predates Jewish Zionism by centuries or, or yeah, by hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, Christian Zionism and their lobby and their influence when Trump was changing the embassy, he, he wasn't, you know, he might have been doing it as a thank you to Sheldon Adelson, but he was also doing it to get the votes of Christian Zionists. Jews are, you know, less than 2% of the United States. Christian Zionists, a much bigger voting bloc. So, you know, that that's all part of that APAC pool. Yeah, and I, remember, I think uh, there was a story where the Israeli ambassador told uh, pro-Israel groups, don't bother with American Jews, just focus on the evangelicals. That's that the new government that I was asked about, that's where they are. They literally, the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which is, you know, the ones who were, were given the mission, you've got to destroy the BDS movement. And now the leader of that is not only the ambassador to the US, but he's also Israel's ambassador to the UN. And that's their assessment that just seeing where the numbers have gone and how what the high percentages of American Jews and Americans who see things for what they are, they've said, stop wasting your time on American Jews. We've lost them. Right. Go after the Christian Zionists. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the, the, we've heard some voices out of Congress calling for um, a, uh, a check uh, before selling uh, weapons to the state of Israel uh, using the Leahy Act that basically says you have to verify that weapons are not used on civilian populations before selling it to any country, which uh, I'm sure none of that ever happens when it comes to any Middle Eastern country for that matter. Um, and, and then Chris Murphy, a senator uh, I, on the East Coast, I forgot where exactly from. Um, Connecticut, I believe. Connecticut, yeah, I think you're right, Connecticut. Um, he, was, he was speaking this week and he's saying, you know, maybe it's time to stop thinking that selling weapons to these countries is the only thing to do with the Middle East. That we should, we should, we should pull back on selling weapons and think about other ways to help them. You know, and he used the example of Lebanon. He says, is selling weapon on, uh, weapons to Lebanon gonna solve the problems in Lebanon? Of course not. So it's just maddening that that continues to happen 
Um, and so you're right that you know, a lot of it is from the military industrial complex selling arms to countries that don't use it for real security. They tend to use it on their own population. And for the state of Israel, they tend to use it on, uh, on Gaza now uh, and in the West Bank. Um, and so where, where do you see you know, this, I wouldn't say movement, but some, uh, some uh, talk uh, by the Chris Murphys, by the Betty, Betty McCollum's in the Congress. Well, like you said, like you know, when we when when JVPLA first launched, you know, ten and a half years ago, there were zero members of Congress who were speaking this way, let alone senators. So I think we have to accept the fact that we have actually come a long way. We have a long way to go, but we've come a long way. Um, the fact that you know. American, you know, elected officials are maturing. I mean, a lot of people said that a long time ago before we invaded Iraq, before we invaded Afghanistan, like that this was not, you know, the way to get what we want. Um, and, you know, a, a lot more are understanding that we need to be able to make sure that our aid to Israel isn't going to do things that actually break American laws. Like you said, the Leahy law, the, uh, the Export Control Act, like we have laws that say we are not allowed to provide military assistance to countries or any entity using them outside their borders, which Israel clearly is, that we have a law that says that you're not allowed to supply them to units of militaries with a record of human rights abuses. Well, how do, how do we get around this? The, 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 those laws are not enforced when it comes to Israel. So when we are meeting with our congressional representatives and asking them to co-sponsor Betty McCollum's very reasonable Palestinian Children's and Families Act, which basically says that I, I agree that we shouldn't be giving weapons you know, supplying aid to the helping the incarceration and tr military trial of Palestinian children, that aids in the demolition of Palestinian homes and aids in the appropriation of Palestinian lands. What she's saying is, we agree to obey you current U.S. law, and the fact that everybody in Congress hasn't signed that is kind of pathetic. But more and more people are, and we invite any congressional represent, representative that we met with that said, you know, the Leahy laws exist, why do we need this? It's because Congress doesn't enforce the Leahy law when it comes to Israel. They are not required to do the reporting that everybody else is. So when people make the argument that, you know, against the three Ds, like, you know, treating Israel with a double standard, I agree about that. We need to stop treating Israel with a double standard that allows them to get away with a multitude of sins that no other nation that we support gets away with. So it's about the law upholding American law. That's right. And implementing international law. And I think, you know, and, and by doing that, I, I, I think we can make some movement uh, towards justice uh, in, in Palestine, Israel. Uh, so we got you working on, on Hollywood projects with us, mm -hmm. and we got you working on LA City uh, elections, starting with the mayoral elections uh, coming up, uh, I think, April of 2022? I think so. I think so. So we have a lot of work to do together, Esty. We do. <laughs> it was great having you. Uh, we applaud your, your bravery and courage and uh, your partnership. Uh, well, so thank, thank you. you so much for hosting this important series. Um, I'm not sure I agree with you about bravery and courage. I, you know, I'm just telling the truth. I'm telling my story. I'm telling the truth. I have skin in the game. Not only do I want to see my Palestinian friends and their families be able to live, you know, a life of fulfillment free of oppression and apartheid. I want my own family in Israel. I want my cousins, children, and grandchildren to have a bright future. I don't want them 
going into the military and being made to abuse human beings. So, you know, this is about all of us joining hands, coming together to create safety and security together. And I'm happy to be in it with you guys. We are honored to have you with us and to be with you, um, Esty. And um, again, I, I, I will um, double what I said in terms of bravery and courage. And when a person just speaks the truth and doesn't, you know, and lets the consequences uh, take, take place and accepts the consequences, that's bravery and courage. So you just uh, define that for us tonight. Well, thank you. I just want to say that, you know, for whatever hardships or, or you know, friends that I've lost, and I have lost some friends, um, it, they're so minuscule compared to the allies and friends and longtime relationships that I, I never would have imagined, you know, how much being part of such a beautiful movement based on truth and love and, and mutual support um, has brought to my life. It, it is just, it's an honor to be able to do this work. And I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity um, to be able to do it with a wonderful, you know, the first Jewish organization I've ever been part of is JVP. And I feel immensely gratitude um, that they're there and that, you know, together we're building a place to make, you know, a bright future for everybody. Well, you have arrived. I mean, I think JVP has arrived. Uh, as you said, it's being noticed now. People are fighting it, fighting it, pushing it back. Uh, and I think that's that's when you deserve, uh, uh, again, uh, a lot of credit uh, for for establishing JVP as as a as a not just a credible voice, but a significant one uh, in the American Jewish community and 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 more importantly in the peace and justice community. So thank you for that, Esti. Thank you, Salam. Thank you to MPAC um, for all the great work that you guys are doing too. And um, you know, let's get busy. Yeah, and, and we want to thank the Islamic Center of Southern California for hosting us and uh, producing tonight's program that you can find on YouTube. If you go to the Islamic Center of Southern California channel, or I believe also the Impact National channel, you will find this recording and all previous recordings uh, of our Palestine lecture series. Next week, we're going to have Professor Sarah Tantawi, another former MPAC uh, person. She used to be MPAC's DC director back in the early 2000s, and then she went on to get her PhD, and now she's a professor at Fordham University. She's going to talk about the nexus of anti-Palestine rhetoric and Islamophobia. So until then, thank you very much for joining us. Assalamu alaikum.